Good morning. On behalf of the Jesuits of Canada, our super, uh, superior father, Eric Olin, and Jose Sanchez, our communications director, I welcome you to our Ignatian Spirituality Conference, which will explore the 500 year history of the spiritual richness of the Society of Jesus. Our presenter for this session, Father James Martin, will speak for approximately 30 minutes and then we will have questions and answers. Please put your questions in the Q&A box um, on your Zoom screen. I'm gonna ask our communications director, Jose, to go over some technical translations and housekeeping details with you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I will switch to French for this bit, just to explain how to access the language interpretation option. Alors, euh, pour choisir la langue de votre préférence, si vous êtes sur un ordinateur, dans les commandes de votre session, euh, cliquez sur Interprétation et après, cliquez sur la langue que vous souhaitez entendre. Si vous êtes sur un appareil mobile, dans les contrôles de votre réunion, appuyez sur euh, les boutons avec les trois petits points au plus et après, appuyez sur Interprétation de la langue. Appuyez après sur la langue que vous souhaitez entendre. Cette session en particulier sera en anglais. Alors, pour les gens qui préfèrent le français, vous pouvez juste changer uh, au canal d'audio en français. Um, I'll go back to English now. Uh, as Pat said, you can ask questions uh, uh, through the uh, question and answer button, uh, also at the bottom or top of the screen, depending on your device. And questions will be answered towards the end of the session. Another reminder is that a recording of all the sessions will be shared with all uh, registrants by five days after the, the event. And if you have technical problems, please feel free to use the uh, technical support button uh, in the main menu within the event center. Uh, and over to you, Pat. Let us pray. Take Lord. Receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my whole will, all that I have and all that I possess. You gave it all to me, Lord. I give it all back to you. Amen. Our land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, let us take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and other cultures. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and commit each in our own way to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. We quote Pope Francis speaking directly to Canadian Indigenous leaders. I also feel shame, sorrow and shame for the role that a number of Catholics, particularly those with educational responsibilities, have had in all these things that wounded you and the abuse, abuses you suffered and the lack of respect shown for your identity your culture, and even your spiritual values. For the deplorable conduct of these members of the Catholic Church, I ask for God's forgiveness. And I want to say to you with all my heart, I am very sorry. And I join my brothers, the Canadian bishops, in asking your pardon. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Father James Martin. Are you in New York? I am. 
Uh, so he's coming to us live from New York City this morning. Uh, Father Martin is a member of the Society of Jesus. He is editor at large for American Magazine and consultor to the Vatican Secretariat for Communication. He is a frequent commentator in the national and international media. Both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have entered him numerous times, interviewed him. He's appeared on many major news networks and other diverse outlets, outlets such as the Colbert Report. Father Martin has written many books, including the New, Time, New York Times bestsellers, Jesus, a Pilgrimage, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, Building a Bridge, How the Catholic Church and the LGBT Community Can Enter into a Relationship of Respect, Compassion, and Sensitivity. His book, My Life with the Saints, was named Book of the Year by Publishers Weekly. And I think we can expect a new book uh, about Lazarus very shortly. So thank you for being with us this morning, uh, Father James, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Patricia. I'm very grateful to be here. I wanna thank the Jesuits of Canada uh, and more broadly, uh, all who work with the Jesuits of Canada for inviting me uh, to join you uh, this morning. I also want to say, uh, uh, Je suis désolé que je ne peux pas parler français meilleur, euh, mais je suis euh, heureux que nous, nous avons les euh, interprétations um, uh, aujourd'hui. So, merci à, à les interpréteurs um, aujourd'hui. So, now, for obvious reasons, uh, I will continue to speak in English. I'm particularly uh, moved to be uh, invited by the Jesuits of Canada uh, in light of Pope Francis's uh, historic apology, which Patricia just read a part of. Uh, and to that end, I want to acknowledge that I am speaking to you I'm from Manhattan, from the ancestral home of the Lenny Lenape peoples. And I want to acknowledge that um, as well before we begin. Um, we're going to be talking today about um, uh, Jesuit spirituality, of course, and prayer. Wonderful thing to talk about anytime. And I'm so grateful I see so many people from all over the world, uh, not only from Canada and the United States, but uh, I saw uh, people from the Philippines and, and uh, Belgium. And so, vous êtes très bienvenue. You are very welcome here today. So, as Patricia was saying, uh, I'll speak a little bit about um, discernment, uh, how we know um, God is speaking to us in our prayer. And it's going to have a two part, um, the, the discussion is going to have two parts. Uh, I'll speak and then you can ask questions. But my own, my own uh, section is going to be divided into two parts. The first part is really what happens when you pray. The second part is how we know uh, what, what happens when you pray is coming from God and not from us. One of my favorite comments was made by a Jesuit uh, friend of mine, an older Jesuit, uh, who said, that not every leaf that falls in front of you is a message from God. <laughs> and we can tend to become so focused on ourselves that we think everything in the natural world is some big message from God. By the same token, some leaves that fall in front of you are a message from God. So how do we distinguish between those two things? Well, first of all, uh, there's, there's two primary ways that God speaks to us. So one, through the, our daily lives through our relationships, uh, nature, music, the sacraments, of course, the mass, um, work, music, entertainment, you know, our, our, our walking around life. And I think most Catholics uh, understand that and accept that. So for example, if you said, uh, I was out in nature and I saw a beautiful sunset and I felt an awe over God's creation and the beauty of God's creation, people would say, yeah, that makes sense. And the the emotion that you felt was a way of connecting with God and God speaking to you. But I think what's more difficult for people is to understand what is happening in their prayer, in their private prayer. Uh, and, and that's a little bit more of a challenge for a lot of Catholics. 
I talk about that in my book. This is the only time I will plug it called uh, Learning to Pray. Let's see if we can get it close to the screen. Oh, maybe not. Maybe I'll put it back here. Learning to Pray. There we go. Learning to Pray, um, a guide for everyone. And a lot of this I talk about in the book if you want more um, explanation. So let's say that you're uh, praying with a particular gospel passage. Uh, and the question is, uh, you know, what, what comes up in your prayer and how do we know that it is coming from God? So let's look less at how we know something um, is coming from God in your daily life and more in your prayer. Okay, well, let's take uh, tomorrow's reading. Uh, so tomorrow's reading is the woman caught in adultery uh, in John's gospel. You know the story. Uh, there's a woman who is literally caught in the act of adultery. Uh, they, the, the scribes and Pharisees drag her out. Tellingly, they don't drag the man out. The patriarchal society they drag her out in front of jesus they throw her on the ground uh and jesus says and that the, the crowd says she has committed adultery uh the punishment is stoning and jesus says his famous words uh let you who is without sin cast the first stone no one does of course and they say he says where are your accusers no one he says go and sin no more okay so let's imagine that we're we're praying about that uh, or even that we're just sitting in church and thinking about, you know, our life. What kinds of things can happen in our prayer? And how do we know that this is God? All right, well, the first kind of thing that can happen uh, is nothing. Okay, so sometimes it feels like nothing much is going on in your prayer. Uh, that's very common. Uh, if we think about prayer as a relationship between us and God, not every encounter that you have with even your best friend or your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend or the most important person in your life, whoever that is, um, is going to feel really rich and warm and exciting. So sometimes it feels like nothing much is going on. There's nothing to worry about. If you sit down and pray with the woman caught in adultery tomorrow or today, and it doesn't feel like a whole lot is happening, that's okay. It doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. It doesn't mean that God has withdrawn his grace from you or God's grace from you. It just means that it doesn't feel like much is happening on the surface level even though I believe that something is going on deep down inside whenever you are in the presence of God. So what kinds of things can happen uh, in terms of the fruits of prayer? The first one would be an insight, just an insight, an intellectual insight. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means that you have a recognition about uh, something about the gospel reading, about Jesus, about God, or about yourself, or about the world. So for example, uh, let's say you have an insight um, that for the first half of the story of the woman caught in adultery, uh, the woman is basically treated like an object, okay, almost like chattel, right? She is pulled from that house. The Greek word, which I can't remember right now, but the Greek word is basically she's caught in the act, okay? So caught in adultery, not simply an adulteress, but caught in the act. And then she's thrown in front of Jesus in a very kind of instrumentalized way. And then we notice that uh, after um, no one has condemned her because they all realize that they're sinful as well, Jesus looks at her, right, um, and, and addresses her. You might have an insight that, boy, this is really interesting that she's gone from being an object to a subject, to a person. You have the insight that Jesus has done this. Jesus has looked at her with love and has spoken with her. You might also have the insight that uh, Jesus has given her life, right? They were going to stone her. The punishment for adultery was stoning. And so he has not only looked at her uh, and, and made her feel valuable as she is, uh, but he has given her life. All right, so it's an insight. It's an insight into Jesus. It's an insight into the Gospels. It's an insight into uh, the way that God works. There's nothing emotional about it. You don't cry. You don't feel this great sense of, uh, you know, anger or joy or anything, but it's, it's primarily intellectual. I think it's very important to understand that these intellectual things that happen in our prayer are just as important as any emotional reactions that we have. Sometimes, and um, uh, I know a lot of people here are familiar with Ignatian spirituality and maybe have even been on uh, Jesuit retreats at Jesuit retreat houses. I'll put in a plug for some of them in Canada. Um, we might privilege the emotion over the intellectual, but that's not necessarily uh, helpful. Simply because you don't shed buckets of tears does not mean that uh, it is not an important uh, fruit of prayer. 
So the first fruit of prayer is insight. The second fruit of prayer, which I alluded to, is an emotion. So let's say you are praying with the story of the woman caught in adultery, and you notice uh, that Jesus looks at her with a great deal of love in your prayer, in your, in, your, in your imagination. And you have this sense of joy. You have a sense of, of God really understanding her and really understanding me, right? Uh, even in our sinfulness, we're all sinful after all. You feel this gaze of Jesus. You feel him looking upon you and you feel a sense of joy. Or maybe you feel sadness uh, for the woman. Maybe you feel sadness for your own sins. And again, we should point out, she's not the only one doing it. There's a man there who was not pulled out of the bed and thrown before the crowd. But maybe you have a sense of sadness over your own sins. So these kinds of emotions are very common that, that when they come up in prayer. Sadness over uh, your sins, joy over Jesus's uh, generosity and graciousness. Um, anger sometimes. Maybe you feel angry that the man is not being uh, castigated as well, and you feel an anger over some things that are going on in our church, where you feel this sense of um, unjustness and the, the patriarchy that truly um, um, casts women in a different light. And maybe you're angry at the way that that is being done today. Maybe the anger um, you know, as Canadians leads to anger over the kinds of things that Pope Francis was apologizing for, okay? So, so all these things are being raised up in your prayer. One of the important things to do is to pay attention to them, uh, because this is one way that God has of communicating with us through such things as insights, and now as we're talking about emotions. So pay attention to those emotions, perhaps discuss them further with God in your prayer. Now that the joy has come up, or the sadness has come up, or the anger has come up, um, what does God want to reveal to you? What would you like to say to God about what you're experiencing? So what I'm trying to say is that these are ways that God has of communicating with us in our prayer. One of the most uh, common reasons that people shy away from prayer uh, is because they don't know what to expect. They think that they're supposed to hear voices or see visions, when it is more of these common things that happen in prayer. So insights, emotions, what else? Desires, a desire can come up. Let's say you're praying about the woman caught in adultery and you notice the way that Jesus treats her, the way that Jesus treats this person who is on the margins, right? Who is being um, castigated and being singled out for her own sins when everybody else is sinful as well. That's one of the points of the story. Right when he says, let you who is without sin cast the first stone, right? Everybody, no one is without sin. So maybe you have a sense of, boy, I wish I were more like that, right? Uh, I wish I were more like Jesus and able to really look at someone who's being excluded or marginalized or vilified in this case, right? I mean, she has committed a sin, but again, so is the man and so is everybody in the crowd. They're all sinful. Maybe you really would like to be like Jesus and you feel a sense of uh, longing to be that kind of person. Maybe you're the kind of person that passes homeless people on the street without a second glance. And so maybe you would like to be a person who's more attentive uh, to people, more compassionate, more, more present, to use a word. But there are all sorts of desires that can come up in prayer. There's a desire simply um, to follow Jesus. So maybe it's not you want to be like Jesus, but maybe you want to follow him more. Maybe you want to spend more time in your prayer and in your daily life and in your life with a more intentional following of Jesus, this person who is so appealing to you. Uh, maybe you would like to um, simply become a better person. Maybe you feel like you're, you're the kind of person who would be in the crowd and would be uh, kind of shunning that, that woman. All right. Uh, there's a desire simply for a more spiritual life. One of the most common desires in prayer, it happens a lot, is when you're having a good time in prayer and things are really relaxed and you feel centered, you say, boy, I really wish I could live more like this. So to live a more prayerful and spiritual and an intentional life. So all these kinds of desires can come up. Uh, and again, these are not simply desires that come up when you're praying with the scriptures, right? When you're doing what's called Ignatian contemplation or Lexio Divina, just kind of, I talk more about that in the book, going through a scripture passage. Now, these are things that can come up 
even if you're sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament or just taking a walk by yourself or just being quiet, these kinds of desires that can come up. So again, pay attention to these desires. A couple of years ago, I was directing a woman on retreat and she was praying with the passage of Jesus is calling the first disciples at the Sea of Galilee, right? He goes and he calls Peter and Andrew and James and John. And when she imagined herself, she imagined herself kind of far away from the action, right? She was sort of an observer and she wanted to join them. She had this experience, I want to join the apostles. I want to be with them. So I asked her if she can see in that desire, God's desire for her, because God's always calling us into those uh, spaces. So in other words, can you see in the desires that are being raised up in prayer, not simply coincidences, not sim coincidences, not simply something that happens to happen uh, or curiosity, but ways that God has of communicating with you. So insights, desires, what else can come up? A memory can come up. A memory can come, can come up. A memories can be uh, painful memories that can come up that uh, God wants to heal. Uh, or a consoling memory, or just a memory that relates to the story. You know, when you think about that, I'm sure you've seen um, films of this, uh, and obviously they weren't filming it at the time, but uh, uh, representations of this story, when she's thrown down uh, in the dirt or in the sand, and Jesus comes up to her, you might have this sense of a time, maybe you have a memory of a time where you were really, um, you know, treated poorly uh, or blamed for something that you didn't do or singled out for treatment uh, or just harassed, right, or even abused. Maybe you have a memory of that time and it suddenly comes up when you're praying about this gospel reading. And you think, boy, that's, that's really surprising because I wasn't thinking about that memory at all and it didn't seem to have much to do with this gospel reading before I started. But it, it comes up. Trust that God is raising up this memory for you for a purpose. It might be a painful memory that God wants to heal, but also it might be a memory um, that is a consoling memory. Maybe there was a time when uh, you felt singled out by, by a crowd even, and someone came to your aid, right? Or you felt God's presence in a certain way. Or maybe there was a time when you were simply alone. You know, this woman is very alone in this story, isn't she? With all the men kind of looking down upon her, right? And who knows what her background was. Maybe you felt alone at some point, and then there was someone that came to your aid or someone that helped you, and it doesn't have to be in a case where you're uh, being attacked, but you just felt alone, maybe in a sickness or uh, losing a job or even during COVID. So what's going on? So this memory comes up, this strange memory comes up. This happens to me all the time in prayer. And you say, what is, what is, what is going on? Well. One thing might be that God might be uh, either asking you to look at a painful memory to help heal you, uh, or that the memory itself might be consoling. It's not surprising that sort of during a time of stress, a time of pandemic, uh, that God would want to console us with a memory that we might not have thought about for a long time. So insights, emotions, desires, memories, what else can come up? A feeling. One of the most common um, experiences that people have reported during the pandemic, which unfortunately we're still in, uh, is a feeling of calm, right? So if you uh, are praying about the pandemic and you are getting um, freaked out and panicky and disturbed, we remember a little bit from our Ignatian spirituality uh, that the good spirit, for those of us who are trying to lead good lives, and I think we have about 700 people, who are trying to lead good lives by looking at prayer, right? We're all trying to lead good lives. The good spirit most often uh, builds up, encourages, uplifts, gives hope. This is what Ignatius says, and it's true. The bad spirit is the one that casts us down, causes, as Ignatius says, I'd be curious about the French translation, gnawing, G-N-A-W-I-N-G, gnawing like a rat would gnaw gnawing anxiety uh, and despair, right? So these are the kinds of things that are not coming from God. And in the pandemic, uh, when, you, when people have prayed um, and they feel a sense of calm and hope and uplift, I always say this is a sign uh, of God's presence. This is a way that God has of consoling you. 
So you may be praying with the woman caught in adultery, or you may be praying with something completely different, and feel suddenly the sense of calm, of peace. Again, it's not an emotion. You're not crying or joyful or angry, right? Or any of the other emotions. It's not an insight. You haven't really uh, had anything revealed to you. You don't really understand the story any differently. It's not a memory exactly. You're not thinking about something that happened. Uh, it's a it's a feeling. It's a feeling of calm. Sometimes it's even a physical feeling that you have, a feeling of physical calm. Trust in that God's communication with you. Again, another way that God has of communicating with you in prayer. Uh, finally, we can talk about uh, words and phrases that come up in our prayer. Now, um, this doesn't happen all the time, uh, but it is something that is important to look at. I would say um, occasionally these things happen. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean physically hearing words, okay? I don't mean hearing voices, although that does happen from time to time. That's pretty rare. In my life as a Jesuit, um, that's never happened to me yet. Uh, I think I'd be afraid if it did. I'd probably be grateful, but you know, some, some clarity. But I do know three people to whom it's happened. Uh, three people are very rational, um, very clear-headed uh, that that's happened to. But for most of us, that doesn't happen. What I mean in, in, in other, what I mean um, instead uh, is, is sort of intuiting words or phrases. And what does that mean? That means, for example, just almost it is as if you're remembering the line for a song or a poem. It, it comes into your mind during prayer. So I'll give you my favorite recent example. Uh, a friend of mine, a Jesuit, uh, was studying uh, in France and finishing up his PhD. Uh, his provincial, the regional superior back in America, asked him to think about what he would like to do for his next assignment. So in the Jesuits, as you know, you're missioned to something, but there's a, there's a conversation. What do you want, right? What are your desires? The provincial takes the desires of the Jesuits seriously. So my friend decided he was in Paris, uh, that he would go to Chartres, um, to the cathedral in Chartres, uh, and make a little pilgrimage uh, and pray there and see what God might want uh, there's a little, uh, um, I wouldn't say manipulation there. Uh, you can't sort of force God uh, to give you an answer to something, but I, you understand the sentiment behind it. Uh, he was going to Chart as a kind of mini pilgrimage. So he got on the train. Maybe some of you have been there. I was there once. Got on the train from Paris to Chart. He gets out, he goes into the beautiful church. He's sitting under the stained glass windows. And my friend was expecting, as he tells the story, something very specific. Like, I want you to teach at uh, Boston College, or I want you to teach at Georgetown, or I want you to uh, write this book on philosophy, or I want you to stay in France, right, at the Centre Sèvres, something like that. So he sat down and he said within five minutes or so, the words came into his mind, feed my sheep feed my sheep. It was kind of unexpected. He didn't hear them. He didn't see them, but they came to his mind, feed my sheep. And he realized that this was God speaking to him. Now, again, that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, my mother was praying a couple of years ago and looked out the window and said, do you love me, God? And the words that came into her mind were more than you know. All right. Now, um, so those are kinds of things that can happen in prayer. Insights, emotions, desires, memories, feelings, words and phrases, okay? All these things, as well as mystical experiences, which are much more profound and much more deep and also much more rare, where you feel a kind of overwhelming sense of, of God's presence. But that brings me to the second part of my talk this morning uh, or this afternoon, if you're in Europe, which is how do I know it's God's voice, okay? Um, how do I understand and how do I discern between uh, what is my voice and what is God's voice. Now, theologically, and not to get too theological, but you know, God's voice is always mediated, right? Mediated through uh, our world, our circumstances, our uh, lives, but also mediated through our prayer. 
right? So unless, um, you know, we are uh, Mary and the angel Gabriel is going to come in front of us or Moses and the burning bush is going to happen, it's mediated. So we have to understand that all of this is going to be coming through our consciousness. Nonetheless, not everything that comes into your mind is a message from God. So how do we understand those things? Well, let's look at, um, let's take as an example, um, my friend's experience uh, in, in the cathedral in Chartres. All right, so let's look at a couple ways that we can discern uh, whether or not this is God's voice. So the first question is, is the evil spirit involved? Now we've already talked about how the good spirit works. The good spirit builds us up, encourages, gives us hope, gives us consolation. The evil spirit, by contrast, the spirit that moves us away from God, uh, is moves us to despair, to hopelessness, to a sense that, uh, you know, everything is impossible, right? Um, nothing's going to work. Everything is awful, right? That, that's despair, basically. So we have to distinguish first, is the evil spirit involved? Or am I being asked to do something that is evil? If you are praying and let's say my friend uh, suddenly has this idea uh, in his mind uh, of punching someone in the face. Let's say there's someone behind him who's coughing in the cathedral in Chart. Right. And he just has this desire. He's praying and he has this desire. I want to punch that person in the face. Well, just because it happens to come to him in prayer doesn't necessarily mean that it is from God. And it does sound like in that case, the evil spirit is involved. Or maybe he's praying and he thinks this is hopeless. I'll never figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, th this whole philosophy degree was ridiculous. I should have never done it. I can't believe I'm so stupid to think that I'd be a good teacher. You know, that is clearly not coming from the good spirit. That's a despairing spirit. And again, these things can sometimes pop into our heads, right? So we have to remember, again, that not everything that pops into our head is coming from God. The second question is, does it make sense? Uh, if I'm praying for it during a difficult time, and I spontaneously remember a time when God was present in my struggles in the past through a memory, um, you know, it makes sense that this is one way that God has of calming us, okay? So it makes sense that, that I would have this um, feeling of calm during uh, a feeling of struggle. It makes sense that a priest would be asked to feed my sheep. It was a much, it's a much more generic call to my friend, but that makes sense. The third question is very important. Does it lead to an increase in love and charity, okay? Uh, that question about should I punch someone in the face just because it comes into my mind, right? Let's say you're you're praying about someone with whom you've had a fight and you say, oh, I want to push that person down the stairs. <laughs> that does not lead to an increase in love and faith and charity, right? Or, oh, I'm going to, I'm just going to not believe in God anymore. That That is not coming from God. It is not leading to an increase in faith. So again, even though these things come into your prayer, doesn't mean it's coming from God. Fourth question is, does it fit with what I know about God? Okay, does it fit with what I know about God in the New Testament? Does it fit with what I know about Jesus? Does, it, does the fact that a priest is being told, feed my sheep, fit with what I know about God and Jesus? Absolutely, that's something that Jesus said to Peter, right? Uh, if you feel a desire to reconcile with someone that you've been having a problem with, that fits with what we know about Jesus. Jesus wants us to be peacemakers. By contrast, saying I'm gonna punch this person in the face, that doesn't sound like what we know about God or what we know about Jesus. So, so does it fit with what we know about Jesus? Is it a distraction? That's the fifth question. Now that's a very good question. Uh, let's say my friend is sitting in chart and he has an image of a hamburger, right? Or an eclair, I guess, to enculturate it. Does that mean that he's supposed to open an eclair shop, open a patisserie, uh, or, or does that mean that he's supposed to work at McDonald's? I mean, I know this sounds silly, but this is the kind of stuff that can come into our prayer. No, it's probably a distraction. Now, when we think about distractions, we have to think about uh, two kinds of distractions, important distractions and unimportant distractions. A couple of years ago, a Jesuit uh, scholastic, a young Jesuit in training came to me uh, and said that uh, whenever he thought about um, 
uh, praying, whenever he prayed, excuse me, and thought about the scriptures, uh, this person who we had a fight with in his Jesuit community came up, kept coming up in my prayer, he said, right? And I don't know what to do about it. It's such a distraction. And I said to him, maybe that's not a distraction. So is it something that God is raising up for you to look at? All right. But what do we do about distractions otherwise? One of my favorite uh, scripture writers, uh, spiritual writers, is Margaret Silk. She's an English writer. Uh, and she wrote a book uh, where she talked about uh, driving. It's a great image. Uh, all, most of us drive, I would imagine, even if you don't drive, you walk. You're driving down the street or walking down the street. You notice things on the, in your peripheral vision. You notice buildings and cars. If you're driving down a busy street, cars going in a different direction. You notice them, but you're focused on the road. You don't let it distract you. Very much the same in prayer. If you have an, uh, an, uh, an experience of thinking about a hamburger or an eclair, you know, you say that's a distraction and you're focused on the prayer. Sometimes people talk about bubbles, birds, and balloons. Bubbles, they come into your field of vision, they pop, they go out. Birds fly into your field of vision, they go out. Balloons, they come up, they go up. That's how you think about distractions. But what happens when you're totally distracted? Uh, you have a pain in your back, there's a noise outside, and you really can't let go of it. Because we're all human, we all have human lives. Thomas Merton said, if you are never distracted in prayer, you've never prayed. Someone just asked for the British author's name, Margaret Silf, S-I-L-F. Uh, so all of us have distractions, and sometimes we can't get rid of them. In that case, I invite you to pray my favorite, one of my favorite prayers, God, I am distracted and I'm still with you. Because God, of course, can be with us in our distractions. But it's very important to, to distinguish between what is a distraction and what is not. Sixth question uh, in that prayer of whether or not it's coming from God, and I'm cheating by looking at my book. By the way, I just want to say, this is in learning to pray. Uh, is it wish fulfillment? Is it wish fulfillment? Let's say you're in a difficult job and you sit down and you say, God, should I change my job? And the yes comes into your mind. Now, that has to be tested out. I think one of the most helpful things for this wish fulfillment is to kind of go back to it and see if it continues, right? So simply because the word yes comes into your mind does not mean that this is a message from God. Wish fulfillment needs to be looked at carefully. Finally, is it important? In my experience, God enters our prayers uh, in these direct ways, um, most often when it is something that is important, to calm you, to give you an insight about scripture, to raise up a memory that will heal you uh, or will console you, to raise up a desire, um, to reveal emotions that you've not been looking at. So God usually enters our prayer, uh, you know, can be frequent, but for important reasons. And certainly when it comes to uh, words and phrases, it's usually something that is quite important. So those are some ways that we can look at how we know uh, it's God. And just to review, uh, we can say uh, the questions are, I need, I need my, my book, uh, hold on. Is the evil spirit involved, number one? Uh, number two, does it make sense? Number three, does it lead to an increase in love and charity? Uh, number four, does it fit with what I know about God or Jesus? Number five, is it a distraction? Number six, is it wish fulfillment? Number seven, is it important? Now, one of the things I want to share with you, my brothers and sisters, with such a nice crowd today, is to trust yourself with this discernment. It, you don't need to be a PhD in spirituality uh, to really figure out and to, to discern what is coming from God and what is not. It's, it's actually pretty simple for most people. If they, are in a, if they are in prayer, it's usually pretty obvious what is coming from God, right? It, it consoles, it uplifts, it helps you, it makes sense. Uh, it fits with uh, your own situation, right? With where you are. And usually people are able to discern, you know, if they think about punching someone in the face for a second or a hamburger, they're usually able to say, this is not coming from God. Uh, when I was growing up in the 1960s, there was a very popular uh, baby book by Dr. Benjamin Spock, uh, not Dr. Spock from Star Trek, uh, S-P-O-C-K. And the very famous book uh, directed to parents, you know, 
um, uh, sort of worried parents was, you know more than you think you do. You know more than you think you do. And so you know more than you think you do about discerning. Trust yourself uh, when it comes to discerning what is coming from God uh, and know that God is going to help you. So um, it's 1141 and that is a, an overview of the kinds of things that can happen in prayer uh, and, and a few uh, helpful tips for discerning how we know what is coming from God and what is coming from us. So um, thanks very much for uh, listening. And now um, I'm happy to answer any and all of your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Father Jim. We have, uh, gener you've generated a lot of questions. So um, I'll get right into them. How can we free ourselves intellectually from the thoughts that swirl around in our prayer and take us away from our emotions and our deepest essence? Yeah, I think to the question is, um, you know, mainly about distractions. And what, you know, as I quoted Thomas Merton saying, if, you, if you've never had distractions, you've never prayed. We're all human. We all have stuff going on physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, I mean, on and on and on, politically, theologically, there's all sorts of things going on. Uh, and how can we let go of those? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat, sometimes it might be something God is raising up, but usually we can say, this is probably not something I'm called to pray about. Okay, and that's, that's something that we can discern. Now, how do we discern that? I mean, let's be blunt. You know, if, if you're having a relationship problem and you've never prayed about that, or a medical problem, and you've never prayed about that, it might be something that God is raising up. But if it is something you've prayed about and thought about and talked about, um, and in a sense, um, understood or put to bed, um, it may be just a distraction. And what do we do? Um, we try to let it go. Uh, think about the Margaret Silf idea of keeping your eyes on the road, even though uh, you, know, you might not be able to sort of get rid of what's on your peripheral vision. Um, but again, I think one of the most helpful things is to say, I am distracted and I'm with you. The Jesuit spiritual writer Bill Barry often talked about prayer as a personal relationship. And, uh, you know, if Patricia and I were going out to dinner and I said, I'm pretty distracted right now because I have X, Y, Z on my mind, she would say to me, that's okay, I'm just happy you're here. If Patricia can say that, how much more can God say that to us? So I think that it's, it's important to try to let go of these distractions, but if not, it's, it's nothing to be guilty about because you're a human being. So just pray at, as you're distracted. You speak of consolation with cause, prayer. What about consolation without cause? Yeah, so that's a very famous Jesuit uh, Ignatian definition, consolation without prior cause. Uh, it is a sense of, uh, of God's presence or consolation, meaning uplift, encouragement, sometimes the gift of tears that comes about suddenly. Uh, you're, you're looking at this outside and you're not really, as they say, recollected, you're not praying, but, and suddenly you have this sense of God's presence or you have a sense of gratitude or you have a sense of peace. Uh, and one of the great things that Ignatius says is only God can cause that. Right, and so in that case, there really isn't much discernment uh, that you need uh, when it kind of overwhelms you. It's a wonderful experience when it happens, consolation without prior cause. Uh, and Ignatius, uh, his famous line is, only God can cause that. You speak of the spirit of evil as an expression of despair. Is it possible that Jesus makes us feel his pain and anguish? If so, for what purpose? We what know great... we know of saints who did not live in joy, or who experienced stigmata. Yeah, what a great question. Um, I would distinguish distinguish between darkness and sadness, uh, and a feeling of uh, sadness over um, sinfulness or the way the world is. Uh, which is an invitation to participate in what Jesus experiences, right? And experiences on the cross. But I think despair is something else. Despair is, you know, God is powerless. God doesn't exist. 
everything is hopeless. Uh, and I don't think that is something that Jesus is asking us to, um, to participate in. But I do think your, your question is very profound that, uh, that we are invited to participate sometimes in the darkness of Jesus on the cross, especially. Uh, but even when you look at something like Ukraine, right, or the, the, the situation with the indigenous peoples in Canada, there's a sense, there's a, an appropriate sense of darkness right uh over suffering and this is this if oftentimes if you're feeling this you know i would say you're also feeling god's uh sadness and god's um pain uh over these 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 terrible experiences but despair i think is saying that god can't do anything god doesn't exist everything is hopeless and i don't i don't think jesus's message is is that but i think that's a very good question what is the difference between meditation and contemplation? What a great question. Now, I would say I'm smiling because, not because it's a dumb question, it's a great question. Uh, it depends who you talk to. <laughs> there are so many different definitions. I went on a retreat once uh, where someone said, uh, meditation is what, th this is, this is one definition. Meditation is what you do. Contemplation is what God does within you. I went on a retreat a few years ago, and the retreat director said the exact opposite. So people use these terms uh, in very different ways. Um, the way I like to use it is I think meditation uh, is, is something that, in a sense, anyone can do, even a non-believer. Right? People can meditate on something. They can meditate on nature. Contemplation, I think, is more in terms of um, a relationship with God. Um, it's the difference between, I would say, meditation and prayer, too. I mean, there are many people who are not believers meditate, which is fine, of course. Uh, deep breathing and those kinds of things. Contemplation and prayer, I think, are more um, about one's relationship with God. But again, if you look at different spiritual books, you'll find 10 different answers on that. Uh, it's 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 a little frustrating, but you know, those are very broad terms. Is there benefit in having a prayer life that allows us to combine individual time of contemplation with group contemplation? Absolutely. You, and you know, as, as I'm sorry, did I interrupt you, Patricia? It's a, it's a long one. Oh, I see. <laughs> we have been having virtual Zoom masses where the homily uh where the homily time allows the parishioners to provide their insights knowledge and experience with the reading i found this group work has added a dimension to my spiritual life and growth in community and relationship should i foster both opportunities as best i can yeah what a great question uh and the answer is if you can yes now, certainly the source and summit of Christian prayer, <clears throat> as Catholics believe, is the Eucharist, excuse me, um, you know, which is a form of communal prayer. Um, but what you're talking about uh, is more um, faith sharing, which I think is very helpful. Um, you know, personal prayer is very important uh, because it is one on one time with God and it enables you to uh, hear God's voice in a different way okay, than you would if you were in a group. So if you're never doing personal prayer, I think there's something lacking in your spiritual life because there's none of that one-on-one -on -one time. I, I often use the example of a couple. If a couple, if you say, do you spend much one-on-one -on -one time with your husband or wife? No, no, we're in the family. We see each other all the time. It's like, well, you need one-on-one -on -one time, right? Or with your good friend or your mother, or your father, or your sister or brother. Um, by the same token, um, communal prayer and, and communal face sharing, as you're describing, is very helpful because we're naturally social beings, first of all, but also it enables us to see how the Holy Spirit is at work in different people, right? And oftentimes, if the Spirit is at work uh, in a different way in another person, it really encourages you to see the Holy Spirit um, as, as, what do I want to say? It, it, gives, it enables you to see the different ways the Holy Spirit can work in you, too. I want to give you an example that I often use. Um, uh, and I also want to greet the novices of the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart who just joined us. Um, I want to give you an example that I often use that I found very profound. 
So as some of you may know, um, I helped to lead pilgrimages to the Holy Land, or at least used to pre-COVID. And uh, at, we would have upwards of 100 people. It's a big crowd, I know. And we'd visit all the sites in Jesus's life. And at the end of the day, we would have faith sharing, um, as this person was alluding to. And one uh, the amazing thing for me was always, this would always happen, the different ways that God had of, of speaking to us. So someone would say, oh, I woke up this morning and I looked out my window and I saw the sunrise on the Sea of Galilee and I burst into tears. And another person will say, yeah, I saw that and it didn't do anything for me. Another person will say, oh, did you hear that line in that hymn that we sang at mass today? Lord, you have come to the seashore. I realized that I was exactly where that hymn was talking about on the Sea of Galilee and I burst into tears and I was so moved. And another person will say, I hate that hymn. We sing it all the time in my parish too much. It drives me crazy. Another person will say, when I walked into the church of the nativity in Bethlehem, I was filled with a sense of awe and wonder. Another person will say, I didn't like that church. <laughs> it was too loud, too noisy. What's going on? God is meeting people where they are. And to answer your question, um, that, that if you're in a group, you see the different ways that God has of, of communicating with people, the different ways that the Holy Spirit has, and yet it's the same spirit. So what does that do for us? Well, it, it opens us up to say that the spirit is not just the way, the, the spirit interacts with people in ways that might be different from the way the spirit interacts with me. Maybe I could look for different ways to uh, have the spirit interact with me and be open to it. And it just gives you a sense of the, the variety that God has, um, and yet the very personal ways that God has of speaking to us. So to your question, um, all these things are, are helpful when we uh, pray or do face sharing in groups. So I would say both are helpful. What's the next step that we should do in prayer when these fruits of prayer come up? What a great question. So I'm following along. So that's Eleanor asked that question, if I can say that. Um, you know, that's a great question. And, and oftentimes uh, it's a, well, let's take insights. It may simply be an insight to help us understand the gospels better, right? And, and gratitude is helpful for that. Um, in terms of uh, emotions, it might be something that God is asking us to look at. One helpful thing to do when an emotion comes up, a memory comes up, a desire comes up, is to do what Ignatius calls a colloquy or a conversation meaning you speak to God about those things. So if you have a painful memory that comes up, maybe you just speak to God about that. If you have a desire to lead a more generous, a more uh, focused life, remember we used the example of the woman caught in adultery and the person who might feel a desire to be as attentive to people on the margins, you might say to God, help me to become like that and might make a kind of commitment. If it's a feeling of calm, it might be just to be able to bask in that uh, and to be grateful. So I think, you know, that's a very good question. I think in different um, circumstances, there's different things for us to do. But sometimes it's just a gift, right? It's nothing to do other than to be aware of it and be grateful. And maybe sometimes God just wants us to give that gift. And so gratitude might be the good, the good response. One of the blessings of prayer seems to be the opportunity for encounter, especially in imagination. The overwhelming feeling is often intensity because Jesus is full of holiness, purity, and obviously God. That is attractive. How do we balance the creative tension of wanting to live that life, a life of sanctity, also with the reality that it will not be easy. Jesus suffered, he died, he went all the way. The lives of the saints show us this as well. How do we surrender more completely in this world? Well, thank you, Natalie, that's a great question. And I think you uh, answered in the question where you talk about it being attention. 
So we all desire to be uh, and to live holy lives. We desire to follow the example of Jesus. Uh, not that we are Jesus, of course, or we could ever be like Jesus. Uh, my spiritual director likes to say there's good news and there's better news. The good news is that there is a Messiah. The better news is it's not you, right? So there's a little humility involved there. Um, we're always going to be sinful. We're always going to fail. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, sin uh, is really missing the mark, like an arrow kind of missing the bullseye. We're always going to miss the mark. Um, and even the saints, as you point out, led lives that weren't perfect. I mean, the saints were, they're not perfect. They're not sinless. Um, they lost their temper. They got angry. They did sinful things sometimes, even after their conversion, right? So I think part of it is understanding that um, in the Jesuit tradition, uh, as St. Ignatius says, uh, we are um, loved sinners. The first week of the spiritual exercises is an encounter with our own, uh, the graces that God has given us, right? And then in the light of those graces, we see our own sinfulness. We see, in a sense, how unworthy we are. So it's to live in that tension of being a loved sinner, but always trying to do better, right? Always knowing that God's going to give us the grace to do better. And not being discouraged when we when we sin and when we have to ask God for forgiveness. So I think that your answer is is embedded in the question. It is a creative tension. Uh, we we are called to live a life of sanctity, but we know that we will always uh, come up short, and that's okay because we're human beings. What about when memories or thoughts are not appropriate? or even potentially sinful in nature? Yeah, I mean, I think then you can see that as a distraction. So to use the example, I keep using this example of punching someone in the face, I guess maybe you could think of all the stuff that happened at the Academy Awards. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can identify them. That's what I'm talking about in terms of discernment. You identify them and you don't need to pay attention to them and you certainly don't need to act on them. So that that's something. They, they can come into your mind. I was just on a Zoom call with a directee, and you know we were talking about this. Just because it's an emotion or a feeling doesn't mean you have to act on it. So you can let it go and resolve not to act on it. That ties into the next two questions, which are very similar. How do you understand the difference between feeling and emotion? Yeah, and that's just a kind of distinction that I was making in the book. Uh, emotions, um, sadness, joy, um, happiness, right? An emotional state. I think a feeling can be neutral. You can just feel calm, right? You can just feel relaxed. There's not an emotion that's associated with that. It's more, it's almost, maybe I would say it's almost a physical feeling. I might have put that in the book uh, as well. So an emotion, happiness, sadness, anger, you can feel when you're relaxed or not relaxed. I guess the feeling I'm speaking about more physical feelings, calm, peace, your body relaxing. Uh, so that, that's what I meant by that. Does Jesus ever speak to us in our dreams? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I would say more broadly, it's, it's God working through our dreams. As we know, uh, dreams are a privileged place um, that God has spoken to people in Scripture, right? I mean, Joseph the patriarch um, in the book of Genesis has a dream, right? Um, that's the story of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor uh, dream coat. And um, uh, in, in the New Testament, jo uh, God speaks, the angel speaks to Joseph, the husband of Mary, in a dream. I, I believe that dreams are a privileged place where God speaks to us, uh, oftentimes when our conscious mind is closed down. Uh, this happens very frequently during retreats for people. They have very vivid dreams. I myself just had a very vivid dream that I called a spiritual director about recently. Um, it seemed completely clear what was going on. I needed a little help to kind of uh, interpret it. So yes, I do think that. But again, not every dream is a big message from God, okay? I think dreams that um, seem to reveal something to us or seem to have a kind of invitation for us um, can prompt us to ask a really good question, which I, I find very helpful, which is, what occurs to you? So that's a helpful question that a director once asked me, not like, what does this mean? Or what is God telling you? Or what's the message? But, um, you know, what occurs to you? 
And is there a part of your life that this might be um, sort of revelatory about? So yeah, I do think that that happens, but again, we have to discern. For question four, does it fit with what I know about God? Is it confined to about Jesus in the New Testament only? What about the teaching in Paul's letters or Jehovah in the Old Testament? Yeah, Eleanor, I would say um, I'd say all those things. You know, what we know about God comes through what we know about God through scripture, through church tradition, through our own experience. So generally what we know about God, and I guess what I meant was um, not so much the specifics, but what, you know, is God a God of peace, a God of love, a God of compassion, right? Um, the, the, the most, um, the clearest way we know about God, we have to say, though, as Christians, is through Jesus. Um, Jesus as the definitive revelation of God. And so if you're confused about what I'm speaking about, I'm, I'm mainly speaking about God as revealed through Jesus. The, the question is, is really about kind of discernment. And I think most of us can say, like, this seems like it's coming from God, right? If you want to punch someone in the face, that doesn't seem like it's coming from God. At least the God is revealed through Jesus. What about the place of getting into silence, interior silence, whose purpose is to leave room for God to either speak to us or just hold us? The holding of our hand and walking along with us, saying nothing but each knowing the love that one has for the other. Yeah, that's a very, um, that's a very popular way to pray. Um, you know, Bill Barry in his book, uh, God and You, talked about prayer as a personal relationship. And I talk about this in Learning to Pray as well. Um, and so a personal relationship with God um, requires the same things that uh, a good friendship requires. So time, honesty, um listening uh and also periods of silence so that image that um you have of, of god kind of accompanying you and holding your hand uh, you know makes sense in relationships not every time that you're sort of with someone you're going to be talking right in fact as um uh, one person when i was writing this book learning to pray uh someone even said that at some points uh talking is actually kind of inappropriate like if you're if you're walking with a friend and you're looking at the sunset together or walking on a beach or walking in a forest if you're talking all the time it might actually ruin the experience right so so i think yes that kind of deep companionship uh is a very wonderful fruit of prayer and it may not feel like a whole lot of um uh things are quote unquote happening but really on a very deep level, uh, it is. Um, a lot of people experience that in centering prayer, you know, a feeling of just being in God's presence very quietly. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. I live in despair a lot. I pray and I study the Bible and attend church and still the despair remains. What can I do? Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I think one thing is to say that true despair saying nothing can change everything is hopeless god doesn't exist um is is not coming from god so one thing to do is if that's the kind of despair that you're experiencing to say that that's not coming from god one um but but if it's darkness or sadness that's a little different that's that's more um yeah that's that's just different i think one thing to do is to start looking for signs of god's presence all right. One of the most effective ways of doing that is through the prayer called the examination of conscience, where every day um, you uh, and I talk about this in the book every day at the end of the day, you take about 10 or 15 minutes to look at places where God has been active in your life, even if it's small places. And I think um, that that is often a great antidote to despair because despair says that God is not present in my life and things won't change and God is not with me. The examination of conscience helps you to look at those places, even those small places where God is present. Could the spirit of evil make us fall in love and still keep that feeling in our hearts without admitting it and have a platonic love for someone? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the, as I understand the question, it was sort of like, um, if you're, in other words, motivated by a spirit of evil that seems to be hidden, that sounds like, Patricia, that sounds like the, the sort of intent of the question, right? It's kind of a hidden yeah. evil, yeah. St. Ignatius calls that, yeah, I suppose so. St. Ignatius calls that the angel of darkness appearing as the angel of light. So let's say, for example, you're a married person and you fall in love with someone who's not your spouse and you're, you know, you know, having sex with that person and it feels like, you know, you're falling in love with that person. Uh, but it's actually the angel of darkness kind of pulling you away from your commitment. Now, this said platonic. Um, I suppose so. I think the key is to say, you know, what is my motivation here? Uh, and as, Ign as Ignatius says, you know, always kind of uh, talk about the motivations and reveal them, for example, to a spiritual director or someone you trust. Because the, the, the key is the, the evil spirit can, come time, can sometimes sort of be hidden through what, what seemingly good. I'm gonna give you a less fraught example. Um, let's say, um, let's, let me give you an example. Um, let's say you wanna work with the poor. You decide you wanna work with the poor and you say to yourself, well, who am I to think that I can work with the poor? I'm no, I'm no Mother Teresa. Um, and I'm, I'm really, I'm really not one who can do something like that. It's very, um, it's beyond me. Now I would say that's the angel of darkness appearing as the angel of light. Why? Because on its face, it sounds very humble, right? It seems good. Oh, I'm, I'm being very humble. But actually what's happening is that it is moving you away from a life of service. See what I'm saying? So the key is to kind of understand the motivation um, behind all of this and and also to look at where it's leading you right I mean if it is leading you to give up a life of service or even just being kind to the poor that's not coming from God if the the spirit that is impelling you into this love is is actually going to harm people like if it's breaking relationships or if it's adultery or if it's you know using somebody right you have to really look carefully at, at the fruits and to say, you know, what has really happened? So, so it is, it is kind of a difficult discernment. But sometimes we have to say, is the angel of darkness appearing as the angel of light? How can I stay focused if I have attention deficit deficit problem like ADD? Well, a lot of people have that um, these days, and the question is, um, you may not be able to be as focused as you would like. Um, but even in your lack of focus, God is with you. So can you, you know, you might, you might ask that question of um, someone who came to you who has ADD. And if they say, well, I have ADD and I'm a little distracted, I'm a little scattered, and my mind goes from one thing to another. I know some people with ADD. You know, you might say to them, that's fine, I'm, I'm still with you. So can you imagine God still being with you um, in your distractions? So, so in other words, part of it is, not getting down on yourself for not being perfectly focused. Do we use the same questions in a group situation? Example, an individual responding in the third round of discernment. Uh, I assume you mean the same questions about whether or not it's coming from God. I think those questions are helpful. Um, yeah. Let me think about that for a second. Yeah, I think those questions are helpful in general. I don't think you need to follow them slavishly. I would say they're they're guidelines. They're not they're not rules. These are my guidelines. Um, so I, I think they'd be helpful. I think that I think it's difficult sometimes to to discern someone else's prayer. So I'd be careful about that. How do I start to pray again after twenty years? Wow. Um, I would say, first of all, to recognize that the desire for prayer is coming from God and to rejoice in that. So if you're asking that question, that means that God is calling you back to prayer, which is a beautiful thing. So to remember that you're responding to a call. It's not just you kind of starting up again. That's the first thing. Second thing is I might um, do something simple. 
right? Imagine yourself speaking to God and maybe catch God up on all the things that have been going on in your life and all the things you wanna to say to God. And then third, I would say, um, try out some different ways to pray to see which one appeals to you. So first is remember that God is calling you and that the desire for prayer is coming from God. It's God awakening the desire within you. Second, uh, try to um, uh, catch up and make up for lost time by speaking to God about what has been going on in your life. 20 years is a long time. Maybe do a little bit of a review even, a little bit of a 20 year examination of conscience. And third, um, try different ways of prayer since it's been a while to see which one fits you or suits you. I like the fact that you talk about calmness because it happens to me often and I feel the presence of God. My question is in relation to people getting excited, upset to demonstrate, to demonstrate God's involvement. Is that honest or trying too hard? <laughs> um, you know, it depends on the person, but you know, I'm also an excitable person. And I think that uh, the Holy Spirit can be exciting for people. And there is an enthusiasm uh, that comes through when people are excited about uh, God's presence. So I don't think we should uh, reject it just because they're not calm. Different personalities, right? I would imagine someone like Paul or Peter or Martha was, were pretty excitable, seems as they come through in the scriptures. Uh, and a lot of the saints were very joyful. Uh, you look at someone like Pope Francis who can laugh and get excited. Uh, so I, I don't think enthusiasm or excitement uh, is a sign that the person is, is being, uh, fake or false. So it, it depends on the person, I would say. The, the same spirit, as I said before, that can calm a person can also excite a person. I have seen that Jesuits use Ignatian spirituality to help people with addictions. I would like to know how the links can be made between the two and who has written on this subject. Um, well, I know that, um, uh, I might, I may get the names wrong, but I think that one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous had a spiritual director for a Jesuit. Um, do you know that offhand, Patricia? No. Yeah. So I think one of the, one of the, one of the two founders of AA, um, drew on a lot of Ignatian spirituality. So, uh, that has been linked to, um, that was the question on spirituality, oh, Ignatian spirituality. Yes. I think that's been written on, but I'm not sure, you know, don't laugh, but I would Google it the way anybody would. I'm not sure who has written on that recently. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of books also on spirituality in general uh, and AA. Uh, Bill Wilson had a Jesuit sponsor, someone said, that's right. There we go, Edward Dowling, and I know, that a woman named Dawn Eden is writing a book on Edward Dowling, who's coming out, which is coming out. And also Richard Rohr uh, has written several books on the different, the, the connection between addiction um, and AA and spirituality. I think one of them is called Breathing Underwater. Um, also James Harbaugh, SJ, um, writes on Ignatius um, and those steps. So look for Don Eden's book, look for anything on Father Edward Dowling, um, and Richard Rohr's book, Breathing Underwater, uh, is very helpful. And thanks for everybody who made those comments in the chat, <clears throat> which is super helpful. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure. We can and should, I think, discern the spirits and outside prayer. You have talked about distractions. But how do we discern in a potentially heatful environment where others are not on the same page as you intellectually and or emotionally? Let's say maybe on a meeting on the synod of synodality, how do you work through your mind when at the same time you are being pressured to come up with something or any other decision making moment? By the way, someone said that there's an upcoming course um, at the Center for Action and Contemplation in Richard's Rohr, Richard Rohr's Center on Breathing Underwater, which is a very good book. Um, 
Yeah, that, you know, group discernment is very difficult. Uh, and as we see that the church-wide group discernment that is going on in the synod is very difficult. There are a couple uh, steps. First is always giving people the benefit of the doubt, right? Listening carefully. Uh, second is trusting that the Holy Spirit is active in everyone. Uh, third, I would say, is no ad hominem attacks. You know, you're a bad Catholic for thinking that. You're a bad Christian for doing this. Um, but it's difficult. And, you know, the, the Holy Spirit can be kind of messy. Pope Francis talked about, you know, wanting to make a mess. Not him, but the Holy Spirit. And I think we have to put up with a little bit of messiness. But I think the fundamental thing uh, is what Ignatius calls the presupposition to the spiritual exercises, which is to assume the best about everybody. I think that goes a long way. What about prayer in the midst of experiencing deep injustice or the absence of God or powerlessness of God in your life situation or the situation where evil seems to have the upper hand? How do you pray then? All right, well, those are lots of different situations. Uh, let me take them one by one if I can find them. Hold on. Uh, can you tell me the name of that person and I can find them? Terry Tree Oria, 11.55. Okay, 11.55. Hold on. I have to take those one by one. Uh, deep injustice. Oftentimes we feel a sense of anger over injustice, and I think that's God's anger working through us. And I think that we have to remember that you know, if we feel angry over an injustice, it might be God moving us to something. That's a very important insight from the spiritual writers that we, you know, how else would God move us to confront injustice, to deep injustice? The absence of God or the powerlessness of God in your situation or where evil seems to have the upper hand, I think part of it is by being honest with God. Those are two different things. Absence of God. Um, you know, I would say ask God for help and ask God to help you see in your daily life where God is present. That's often a feeling of interior absence. Powerlessness of God or where evil seems to have the upper hand, for example, in Ukraine. Uh, I think part of it is being honest with God about our frustrations and what's going on, begging God for help. But again, being open to the fact that the emotions that we feel um, may be God moving us to action. We use psychological terminology to speak spirituality. How do we discern between what is psychological from what's spiritual in our prayer? Um, that's a great question. You know, our prayer is going to be mediated through our psychology. Okay. And so, but I do think um, that's a very profound question. I, 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 I'm not sure I'm an expert enough in psychology to talk about it, but I would say that there are certain things that are psychological in nature, right? Depression, um, you know, feelings of anger over abuse, um, uh, difficulties with our family of origin, okay, that do need to be looked at psychologically, okay? That's not to say that our prayer cannot help us with that, but I do think that there are some things that need to be brought before a psychologist um and not a spiritual director I mean, you can bring him but and i think what happens is if you go to a spiritual director uh they might say you know what in addition to spiritual direction um you might benefit from th some therapy and i think that um uh, those two things often work together so i think it's, it's a question of doing those things together and enabling professionals professional spiritual director and a professional therapist to be able to pull apart the threads um, in those things. But again, you know, our spirituality happens through the, through the lens sometimes of our psychology. How can we reconcile movements within prayer regarding a ministry to which one feels called or to deepen? For example, when there is a hard wall or a dysfunction within the church system, which seems to block that movement. How do you do centur cum ecclesia in these circumstances? These are really, these are very tough questions. Well, look, I would say, let me, let me can you, sh can you share me who that, where that was? So it I was an anonymous 1145. 
I need to read. That's quite, it was quite complex. 11.45. Anonymous. Anonymous, hold on. All right. How do we reconcile moments within prayer regarding a ministry to which one feels called or to deepen? So a ministry, when there's a hard wall or dysfunction within the church, Simpson, oh, I see what you mean. Um, so it might be, for example, a woman who feels called to ordination. That may be what this person is talking about um, when there is a hard wall. Um, I think part of it is being honest with your prayer. You know, there are women who feel called to ordination. Okay, and I'm not challenging church teaching. I'm just saying that there are women who I know who feel called to ordination. Um, and what do they do in those situations? I think part of it is continuing to be honest with God in prayer, continuing to be honest with um, your spiritual director in prayer with that, uh, continuing to ask God for a clarity on that, what that might mean for you uh, in the current um, church, right? And Sentier Cum Ecclesia is thinking with the church in those situations and what might what might be I what might I be invited to see about the church and about myself in that situation? It's a very difficult question. So, but I think honesty is key. And our these final really hard, let me tell you, these are hard questions. These are not easy questions. This is a test. Oh yeah, it's like my MDiv comps. Um one final question. What about apparitions of Mary? Great. Um, I'm glad to end on that. Um, so Maureen's question, apparitions of Mary, which happen. I'm a very big um, devotee of Our Lady of Lourdes and Our Lady of Fatima. Um, I've been to Lourdes many times, and I believe that, you know, Bernadette was describing her experiences accurately, that St. Bernadette Subaru had several apparitions of Mary beginning in 1858. At the same time, the church does not require um people to assent to what it calls private revelation okay so you can still be a good catholic and not be uh you know someone who's devoted to lords so i i think that you know these these apparitions happen i think they're rare uh, i think that the church is very wise in trying to discern whether or not they're authentic or not it clearly to me uh bernadette's apparitions at lords were authentic now the questions are why doesn't mary appear more often we could say maybe she appears, you know, frequently enough. Uh, but I think they're, they're revelations of God's love and God's mercy for us, also of Mary's love and mercy for us. Uh, and they always point us to Jesus, right? I mean, as someone pointed out to me, uh, well, it's not the most original thing, but, you know, Mary's last lines in Scripture are do what he tells you at the wedding feast of Cana. So I'm, I'm a fan of Lord's, but again, it is private revelation, um, and it is not something that someone has to believe in as a Catholic. Um, Father James, thank you very much for being with us this morning to uh, start our weekend conference on Ignatian spirituality. Your presentation was interesting and reflective, and you've given us insights and practical tips that will help us find God in our lives. I hope we can all gain the skill to listen to God's voice on our own personal journeys. And for those who want more information, um, uh, Father Martin's book um, is on sale everywhere. So thank you very much, um, Father James, for being with us today. Well, I want to say uh, thank, thank you, Patricia, um, uh, for uh, certainly for doing this um, facilit facilitation. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone at the Jesuits of Canada uh, for inviting me to this wonderful morning. We had such a big crew. I, you know, you never know how many people are going to show up. I was amazed at how many showed up. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I want to thank the uh, interpreters. Merci beaucoup. Uh, and again, je suis désolé que je ne peux pas uh, parler un peu meilleur, um, you know, peut-être la prochaine fois. Uh, but I'm very happy to be with you, and I just would ask you to keep me in your prayers, too. Uh, should we end with a prayer, Patricia, on this, for this moment? Oh. Just a few technical um, things before that. Yeah. So, quick reminder that uh, the recording for this session and all others will be sent to everyone who registered by five days after the event. We invite you to uh, check out the connect with others section to chat with other participants 
and the exhibit hall to uh, speak with our uh, spirituality partners and other resources and connect with other resources. And then um, <clears throat> lastly, um, oh, that was the last thing. Okay. So, um, uh, before we end, I'd also um, like to express thanks to Jose, our director, who's, who is leading us uh, on all of our the main things that we need guidance on, and also to Fanny um, and our translators, Patricia and Isabel. And most of all, thanks to our audience for being with us. Our next session will be with Sister Laurence at 1 p.m. today. What should I do? Making good decisions individually and in groups. And uh, Perhaps I could ask Father Martin, could you um, give us a closing prayer? Sure, and I too wanna to thank uh, Jose and Fanny um, and Isabel and Patricia, merci. Uh, so let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for bringing us together this morning or today. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit in our lives that inspires us and impels us to pray. As we enter more deeply into this Lenten season, we ask you to deepen our prayer and our relationship, especially with your son. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Amen. Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you all so much and merci and uh, au revoir. Thank you.